Hello. Um, I wanted to give you some sort of an introduction to proving statements uh, directly, especially if you have never taken a class on proofs. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit more explanation than maybe um, what you would have seen in class or another example. So let's say we wanted to prove the following. If A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. Now I know this, this um, theorem, the, this theorem has nothing to do with linear algebra, um, and that was actually on purpose because I wanted to um, just take us outside of linear algebra and not worry about that part, put you in familiar territory um, so that you can might be able to think about how you could prove it without having that connection to linear algebra right now. So um, when you see this statement, you might say, oh, that's, that's really obvious. Of course, that's true. Um, but what if somebody came up to you and said, I don't believe you? Uh, how would you prove it to them? So let's think about that. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this. If A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. When you're trying to prove a statement, really the first thing that you want to do is uh, make sure you know all the definitions of all the words. Um, given, and also make sure that you believe the statement. So, let's start by doing an example um, to make sure we believe it. What is A? What is B? What is C? Um, how does this work? So, let's say A is 5, B is 10, and C is 60. So, um, five, div 5 divides 10, 10 divides 60, and 5 divides 60. So here is if A divides B, here is B divides C, and here is A divides C. And what about these two statements makes the conclusion that 5 divides 60? Now all of those are true. What if we were to actually change A, B, and C and make it something, um, something like A is... 5, B is 10, and C is uh, 17. Here, 5 divides 10. 10, up. Oh, it does not divide 17. And 5 does not divide 17. Does that make this statement false? Well, in fact, it doesn't make it false because in our assumption, A divides B has to be true, and B divides C has to be true. And since our B does not divide C in this uh, example, it makes this statement what's called vacuously true. I'm, I'm uh, taking an A, B, and C where the assumption is not true. It doesn't make it false, it just means I have a non-example. Okay, so let's see. back up a minute. Okay, so also I want to go ahead and, and define this word divides. Notice that when we talk about divides, we're uh, talking about integers. Remember what integers are? Um, they are positive and negative whole numbers, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on up, or negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 on down. So if I've got two integers, m and n, and I want to say that M divides N. What does this mean? So a lot of you might have some different notions about what this means. Um, but we want to define it exactly. Uh, it means there exists another integer K such that N equals K times M. So for example, 5 divides 10 because 10 equals 2 times 5. 10 divides 60 because 60 equals uh, 6 times 10. 5 divides 60 because 60 equals 12 times 5. So in order to be able to say that one integer divides another, I need to be able to show that there's um, a third integer such that n equals that third integer times m. Okay. So, let's get to proving it. 
Now we have if a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c. How am I going to prove this? So when, we, when I start my proof, if I'm doing this directly, I'm going to start with the assumption. I'm going to suppose that a, b, and c are integers such that a divides b and b divides c. That's how I start. I'm always, when I'm proving directly, I'm always going to start with that assumption, that if part. Um, and of course, you mean will in, enable, excuse me, I'm messing up my words. Uh, to be able to actually use that definition of divides, I need a, b, and c to be integers. And so what I want to do now <coughs> is I want to fill up the rest of my proof with facts and definitions, things that we know to be true. Um, so that I can then get to a, the logical conclusion that A divides C. So the in-between are just facts um, and conclusions that I can use. So that's what I want there. So let's try to fill that in. <coughs> Remember what our end goal is. So most of the time, after you have a, um, an assumption, you're going to start talking about why that assumption is true. So we're going to start by using the definition of divides. So from that definition of divides, there exist integers k1 and k2 such that b equals k1 times a and c equals k2 times b. Those are the definitions that a divides b and b divides c. Notice I'm even telling you where that statement comes from. I'm leaving no room for ambiguity. Okay. So then what can we conclude from that? Remember what we want to get to is that A divides C. And A divides C means C equals an integer times A. So we want to have some statement C equals an integer times A. Okay, so let's take those two equalities and in the second one, we're going to, instead of write B, we're going to take this one and write K1 times A. So, hence C equals K2 times K1 times A by direct substitution. We're directly substituting K1 times A in for B. Okay? So what did we want? We want that A divides C. We want that C equals an integer times A. So right now we have C equals this quantity, K2 times K1 times A. And the question is, is that an in integer? Well, yes it is, but we have to say why. So since K1 and K2 are integers, that means that K1 times K2 is an integer. You could say that this is by closure of the integers, but um, I'm not going to require that of you. I, I do expect you to say that k1 times k2 is an integer, though. So, um, what did we want? We wanted to be able to write c as an integer times a, and that's what we have. And so, that tells us by the definition of divides, then a divides c. So, I also want to include that by the definition of divides. So I'm going to erase a little bit and rewrite by the definition of divides A divides C. Okay. So what I want you to see here is that our proof is done now. We have started with our assumption, we have ended with our conclusion, and the only things in between are our definitions and um, statements that we know to be true. So, we're going to tell our reader that we are done. Many times this is done by a box at the end, or if you don't like a box, you can maybe draw a little smiley face to say, I'm done. Some people like to draw um, a big exclamation point, I'm done. Um, giving a nice proof feels really good that you've, you've convinced someone that your statement is correct. Okay, so this was direct, sub, uh, direct proof. Um, there are many other types of proving, but this is the most basic direct proof. Start with your, your assumption. Use only 
facts and definitions that you know to be true and end with your conclusion.